Today is Mother's Day, and I was actually wanted to share a certain message, but I find that I get I find no groove in the message that I want to share. So obviously the Lord bring me back to this track to talk about mother, that how what a blessing of a godly mother can be, and what what really um, when a woman is really have a strong fear of the Lord, when the woman is free with the Holy Spirit, you can change the destiny of your children. Amen. So we're going to start this story in Genesis chapter 24. We are familiar with this story. This is the story of Rebecca, uh, who has bawled, or, or rather when she was pregnant. Yeah? And, and in verse 21, it says, that, And Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. Yeah? But, the children, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire the Lord. So this is a situation. When Rebecca was pregnant, she has got twin. And not only she got twin, the Bible said that she felt that there was something struggling within her. And she went to inquire of the Lord. That's a very good thing to do. That when anything that you sense is amiss, first thing you go, check with the Lord. Amen? And that's continuing going forward. He said, and the Lord said to her, and this is a very powerful thing, listen to this, guys. He said, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from one body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, we have been through this story before. In fact, at different perspective, at different anger. Yeah? But today, I want to show you how the blessing of a godly mother can change the destiny of her children. So, just to reiterate this point for some of you who have not attended the previous session, the Bible said two nations are within the womb. Not just a twin, not just two children, not just two kids, but two nations. Now, this is a very powerful word from the oracle of the Lord. She went to seek you know, the oracle or the, the seer in those days. And the oracle said that two nations are within your womb. Not just two person, two nations. That means there are two different kind of people that's within Rebecca's womb. And 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 they say, and they shall be separated from your body. That means when these two persons come out, they're gonna be separated because they are from a different in the sense they represent different species and they represent a different kind of people. And they say one people shall be stronger than the other, but they say, but the older shall serve the younger. There is this covenantal blessing that comes to this younger child. Even though traditionally in the Hebrew culture, the firstborn always get the double blessing. Even the firstborn is appointed with primacy. That means the firstborn usually is granted with more blessing and ultimately been appointed to take over the priesthood lineage. This is a very powerful thing. When you are firstborn, you are preferred. And in that sense, this continues in some Chinese culture. If if the if a grandparents have the firstborn grandchild and this is a boy, wow, you know, big celebration, right? And this boy will be spoiled like me. <laughs> I, I I was I was my 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 dad is my grandmother's favorite. So when 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 he had me as a firstborn as a boy, wow, you know, I was treated like a little emperor. I've said that I'm a poor emperor. You know what I mean? The funny thing is, those days, even you're poor, your grandparents should treat you very well. So you are granted a lot of uh, privilege. And so I think the Chinese got a little bit of this culture from the Jews that firstborn, especially if their son, daughter, no need to mention. Daughter is the most chuck aside. Yeah, unfortunately, those days, that culture. But today, parents are beginning to realize actually, daughters are better assessed than son. Yeah, and so unfortunately, because you know, where a son has to look after not just the parents, but the family. So they're always torn between responsibility. Yeah, as a son, I understand. As a father, as a son, there's this, always this dual responsibility that you need to be a good husband, good father, and a good son. You know, so this trying, this trying responsibility doesn't split a person. You know, you, you don't know where to put your allegiance because there's two women. So, if you are a mother, if you have a son, please be easy on your son. Yeah, That means don't possess him like the way you possess, as if he's your possession. But give him space, and so that when he's independent, you can let him go easily. Amen? So, back to this. He said, two people shall be separated, and there's two nations. We talked about this uh, in a previous message. Not only there's a twin inside, but two different people. 
It said that indeed there are twins in her womb. The first came out red, it was like hairy garment all over. So they call his name Esau. Of course, the other one we know, we call him Jacob. And this is a very pivotal moment for Rebecca because when she went to inquire of the Lord, she received the word that actually the younger shall take primacy over the older. He said, the older shall serve the younger. This is a very strange uh, principle you find traditionally from since Genesis 3. Even though traditionally the Hebrew practice is to favor the firstborn, but since the fall in Genesis 3, every first is rejected by God. Cain was the firstborn, rejected by God. Abel is preferred. Adam is the first Adam, rejected by God. Second Adam, Jesus, is received by the Lord. Ishmael is the firstborn, rejected by the Lord. Isaac is the one that's favored. Esau is the one that's firstborn, rejected by the Lord. And Jacob is favored. In fact, Romans 9, 23 says, Esau I hated, but Jacob I love. You find even the first wife, of Jacob, Leah was rejected. The second wife, the wife that she wanted to marry, which is Rachel. Even the first king of Israel was rejected, King Saul. The second king is accepted. Even the first nation, Jews, in that sense, is right now rejected. It's the spiritual jewel at this moment. is rejected. It's received the spiritual jewel that's received by the Lord at this part of time. So you find that there is this hidden principle of second. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46, it says, it is not the spiritual that's first, but it's the natural that's first, then the spiritual. 1 Corinthians 15, 46. And this is a very powerful principle because you'll find that even Peter, in his first early zeal with the Lord, his first three years with Jesus, all the zeal that he prepared, all the zeal that he displayed. Wow, Lord, you know, where you go, I go. 1 Corinthians 15, 46, if we can flesh that. Where you go, I'll go. So Peter demonstrated a lot of zeal. But even the early days, Peter eventually was found to be actually one thing. It is the Peter after Pentecost that was different. It is the Peter after Pentecost that becomes spiritual. The first Peter before Pentecost was natural. But the subsequent Peter is spiritual. I find also in my early days to serve the Lord, first 25 years all natural. Ooh, a lot of natural strength. You know, you want to serve God, you're enthusiastic, you make things happen, you know. You, all that you involve is just your natural zeal. And some, for some of us, God can take a long time to actually let our natural zeal just to, to expand and make sure that it's all spent before God can really engage us. So you find in the kingdom of God, the first is always the natural. And then come the spiritual. And so in this instance, Rebecca hear the oracle from the Lord. And he said that the older shall serve the younger. And she took it to heart. For her, this is a very important piece of information. She believed. But he said, but the, but the older will be stronger. One will be stronger than the other. You see, in the divine order of God, you will find, as I mentioned this before, in the kingdom of God, it is always the stronger that will submit to the younger. So don't be surprised that if your enemy is always seems stronger than you. Amen? That's why when you have spiritual understanding, you can walk by faith. If you don't have spiritual understanding, every time you pray, you pray out of fear. It's not out of understanding. Because it is ordained. He said, one, prepper, one people will be stronger than the other. In this instance, Esau is stronger than Jacob. Because the Bible says Esau is a hunter. But Jacob is a man of the tent. That means he is just a very studious guy. But Esau is a hunter. So when you are a hunter, physically you are stronger. But yet the one that is weaker and younger will reign over the one that is older and stronger. So if your enemy appears to you as stronger, relax. It is ordained by God that the stronger one will come under the reign 
of the younger one and the weaker one. Amen? So that's the weak. That's why the Bible says, let the weak say, I'm strong. Let the poor say, I'm rich. Because you know why? Because God ordained in things in such a way that every time when you are weak, God will become strong. That's why Paul said that your strength is made perfect in my weakness. For your grace is sufficient. When you understand this principle, your fear over time will go lesser and lesser and lesser and lesser. When you pray, you pray with understanding. You no longer pray out of desperation and then you think that it is your fasting that moves God. You, we think that it is our intercession that moves. No, it's ordained. It's ordained. Is it the stronger? Then one person, one of the one of the people will be strong, but the younger will reign over the older. That means in the kingdom of God, the weak will always reign over the strong. If you think this is good news, say amen. Now this is tremendous because this gives us faith. You see, this is what produces faith. Faith is not just blind, you know, just you know, just walk by faith and without understanding. No, that's not that's foolishness. That's assumption. That's hoping for the best. <laughs> no, that's not faith. Faith is based actually on scripture. But I must say faith comes by what? Hearing the, the word of Christ. In fact, as I mentioned, the Greek version, faith comes from understanding the word of Christ. So when we understand the divine order, when you face, in fact, as I mentioned this before also, it's a good reminder for those who have not heard this. Every of Israel's enemy is always bigger than them. Every of their enemy is always bigger than them. Look at Gideon, 300 soldiers. How many enemies they have? 120,000. Really? Yeah, we go to war with Jericho. They just came out of Egypt for crying out. They don't even have a proper army, and straight away they're faced with the war of Jericho. Huge. The Bible says even chariots can run over the wall, and yet without you know any mighty weapon, they conquer Jer uh, they conquer Jer Jericho. Goliath is way bigger, and yet Goliath fall under the power of David. So, guys, that means if you understand this principle. Every time when you see a storm that seems overwhelming, every time when you see an enemy that seems to be bigger than you, don't panic. You see, the man with good understanding will be at peace. The righteous shall live by faith. There is a divine peace that covers. You see, faith always, let me say this, peace always follows faith. When you have got faith that follows knowledge, your faith is a solid faith. That means it's not a volatile faith. One day I feel good. If I see the weather is good, I feel good. If I see the storm gets, you know, big, I get threatened, my faith goes down. And then we panic, you know, we think the way to get God to respond to us is to fast more. And there's a place for fasting. But let me tell you something. There is more than fasting, there is a more important place with proper knowledge. That means when you have proper knowledge, when you know that God has ordained since the day in Genesis 25, that He said the older will eventually submit to the younger. The weaker will reign over the stronger. It's ordained. So when you meet the enemy that's stronger than you, don't panic. Know that they, you, when you have sufficient faith, you will reign over them. That means if you are like David, your Goliath looks bigger. Not only it looks bigger, it is factually bigger. Understand this. It's ordained by God that your Goliath will fall under you. Provided you move by faith. Amen? Provided you have trust. The Israelite, the soldiers, professional soldiers were all threatened by Goliath. Only David who knows God knows he can take down. He said, today I will chop your body into parts and feed to the birds of the air. Amen. So he said, and the Lord says, and so he said, the first which shall be called, and the first one they call him Esau. Let's go for the moving 26 to 28. He said, afterward, his brother came and he sent to hold of Esau's heel. And so his name is, was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bought them. And so the boys grew. Esau, as they said, was a skillful hunter. That means he's really physically strong. A man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. That means he's just basically studied the Torah. And Isaac loves Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Rebekah loved Jacob. And she has a very, very good reason for just, just doing that. And today I want to show you something that's very mysterious. Let's go on to the next two verses. And it says, And Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field. He was weary. 
And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with the red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name shall was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. Now we also have covered this before. When we are like Esau, we represent the natural man. The natural man will always value the physical more than the spiritual. The natural man cannot understand things in the spirit. The spirit has to be spiritually discerned. So for the natural man, the physical appetite is far more valuable than the spiritual blessing. So when he came in from the field, he was physically famished, Esau. And he said, hey, give me this chapati, this rendang, you know, because, you know, I supper there a long time, no, no supper there already, right? Give me, sell me your birthright as of this day. And then what does it say? Uh, going forward, 32 to 34. He said, Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright? You see, people in the natural will always put priority over the natural desire. I'm single, you know. So therefore, I need to have more time. So I got no time. More time to look for a husband. So I got no time to serve God. Or I'm married. So I got. I need to have more time with the family. No less time for God. These are not wrong by itself. Yeah, everybody has responsibility to live as a parents, as a single, whichever station in your life. We all have varying responsibility, and we should not abdicate our responsibility. But eventually, we should not let our personal responsibility take precedent over that which is spiritual. So Jacob saw an opportunity. He was actually a very wise man. He saw that this brother who is motivated by the physical, he said, hey, sell me your birthright. Wow. He said, today, sell me your birthright. And Esau, that's why God hated Esau. Because Esau was so casual. He said, what good is about to die? What good can this birthright do for me? He was very, very foolish. You see, in the kingdom of God, it is always defined by people who are wise and people who are foolish. This decision to settle his physical need is a very foolish decision, a very short term, a very, very short sighted uh, uh, position. That means you only see the present, you don't consider the future, neither do you perceive the spiritual blessing that's hidden in the birthright. And so many of us sometimes make decisions in our life because of the natural condition. Hi, because I need this, because I need to have that, because you know there are physical consideration, and we give up our spiritual blessing. Today, unfortunately, many people are pursuing family, career, business, personal pleasure, all this at the at the cost of their future blessing. Uh, you know, I was just sharing with one of our members. I said today, people when they talk about future blessing, the kingdom of God, uh, people got no interest. You know, I mean. It, it's too far away. I need to talk about my retirement fund. <laughs> and I mean, how am I going to retire you know, in Singapore? It's more important, can I survive? You know, when do I retire? When? Now, what is that important? But, but if you put this as far more important than the spiritual, then you're foolish. It takes spiritual understanding to understand the value of spiritual blessing. So Jacob gave Esau bread and stews of lentil, and he ate and drank a rose. And the Bible says in verse 34, and Esau despised his birthright. Esau is a different Esau represents the people in the nature. Jacob represents the people who are spiritual. People in the nature always despise everything in the spiritual. That's why people who walk in the nature say, come for discipleship. Yeah, Pastor, I'm so busy. You know, I'm so tired. You know, their physical need takes over. Oh, I've got other things to do. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. Because we don't see long term. We, we don't see how birthright can actually change our life. And so, so Jacob was perceptive. He said, sell me your birthright. This, I believe, was a move inspired by God. He took the opportunity. He did not cheat the brother. He just proposed to the brother. And the brother just casually said, you know what? Well, I'm going to die. What's, what's the birthright going to do? I'm going to die. And let's continue in chapter 20, 20, 27. So 26 talked about you know, the, 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 the father's life, but now 27. He said, now it come to pass. Isaac was old in his eyes and his dim could not see. He called Esau, his older son, and said, my son, here I am. He said, Behold, I'm old. I do not know the days of my death. So, this is a time where, you know, 
Isaac is pretty old already. The Bible, the Bible said that his eyes are dim. That means he can't really see, almost blind already. Yeah? And then continuing the few verse. And it says, And therefore take your weapon, your quiver, bow, go to the field, hunt again for make me the savory chapati and rendang such as love and the briyani and bring it to me that I may eat and the abode and the abo, no, adobo and the lechon you know, that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Actually, a lot of important things happen over food you know, in the Bible. Yeah. Adam and Eve, because of food, lost the territory. Jesus over food blessed us with a new covenant. In this instance, over food, somebody's going to get blessed, somebody's going to lose blessing. And so, you know, and, and I always ask the Lord, why, why, why must eat before you bless people? In the Jewish culture, actually in their Shabbat, they always, during their food time, after the food, they will bless their children. Over every Shabbat, the, the Jews will pray over and bless their children. Uh, it is said in the Jewish tradition that when your stomach is full, there's abundance in your heart that you speak even better. That your blessing really is, you know, out of your, out of your full, full stomach, good words will come out. But when you're hungry, I, I like you saw, I, what's good is birthright. I, I'm going to die. Yes, take it. You know what I mean? You, you, you make foolish decision. Yeah. Go ahead. Continue. Next few verses. And Rebecca, and the Bible says, and Rebecca was listening. Now, this is a good mother. Tell me, this mother is paying attention. She is spiritually aware of what is happening. This is not a mother that's sleeping. This is a mother who is spiritually aware of what is happening. So when this conversation goes on, you see, the day when Isaac gets older and older, Rebecca gets more vigilant and vigilant. Tell me, she know any conversation they have, it, let me let me let me have an ear into what's happening. And the Bible says, and, and Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, and Esau went to the field to hunt him, bring it back, and listen to this. And Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother. And he told his son, Bring me game, make savory food for me, that I may eat, bless you in the presence. Eh? This is, this is who says to who, eh? Oh, he said, the father speak to Esau. Yes, thank you. So he said, the, you know, this, this uh, uh, Jacob, Isaac was speaking to Esau. Yeah, bring me, make me game, savory food. Therefore, obey my voice according to what I command you. And then continue. Go to the floor. Okay, this is Rebecca telling Jacob. Now listen to this. This is an important part. Because for a long time, I don't understand why God approved Rebecca was such act, right? Rebecca was cheating, seems like, right? How come God blessed this act of cheating and lying, right? He said, go now to the flock, bring me two choice kid goats. I will make savory food for them for your dad, such as he loved. Then you take it to your father, he may eat it, that he may bless you before his death. Now, Jacob was pretty innocent. Then the next few verses, he says, that, but you know, Jacob said to Rebecca, look, Esau is a hairy man. I'm smooth looking, a smooth look, uh, I'm a smooth skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me. And I seem to be a deceiver to him. And he shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Now, this is a very, very intriguing part. This is a mystery in this part. That means Rebecca, when she went to consult the oracle when during her pregnancy, when the oracle told her that, look, your older son eventually will serve your younger. Your younger eventually will rule over your older. She understand this. She understand this is the will of the Lord for the younger son. She took it to her. And so even though, even though Esau has sold the birthright to Jacob, nonetheless, just to be sure, she made the decision to actually enforce what is already firstly sold by Esau. That means Esau has sold his birthright. When you sell your birthright, it means the blessing of the firstborn is sold to your brother. Yeah? Now this is one layer of it. The second layer of this, you must understand that over time, from Genesis 3 to 25, there has been period and layers of separation. That means after the Tower of Babel, there's so many separations between Cain, the city of Cain, and the city of Seth. Between the generation of Cain and the generation of Seth. And then eventually you come to Genesis chapter 11, where God called Abraham out of separate Abraham from the Earl of Chaldean. That means God pulled Abraham from all his clan and take him out. 
a separation. And then out of Abraham, God has to separate again between Ishmael and Isaac. That means again their separation. And then the final separation is Jacob. Esau and Jacob. Because out of Jacob's loin come the 12th tribe of Israel. So that means there must be another last separation. This last separation is very pivotal because in this last separation, whoever get the firstborn, who get the first blessing of the firstborn shall determine the future of the clan. And because in the Garden of Eden, the serpent deceived Eve and Adam. Let me tell you, God is also, that's why he said, in Matthew 10, I think 16, he said, be as, be as wise as a serpent, but be as innocent as a dove. That means what God is saying is that when it comes to your enemy, you need to be wise. That means when it comes to your enemy, that means when it comes to human being, always be as innocent. When do you become a serpent? Not when your friend is a serpent. No, no, no. Even if your friend is a serpent, you still need to remain innocent. Okay? But this serpent is only used for the invisible enemy, not your physical enemy. That's why I say, for your battle is not against flesh and blood. Love your enemy. Why? Because the people in flesh and blood is never your enemy. They are just an object manipulated by the spiritual enemy to attack you or to sometimes cause you misery. So that's why these are not your enemy, because they are also held captive by the enemy. But the real enemy is the serpent. And when you come to serpent, you are allowed to deal with him accordingly. As the serpent deceived Eve, God orchestrated Rebekah to deceive the enemy. That means the firstborn that's rejected by God, Rebecca understood it because there were two battles that was battling between her womb and God said, ha ha, but the younger will eventually be served by the older. She took that to heart and she understand that the first is always rejected. It is the second that is accepted. So when she did that, actually, in the bigger scheme of things, God is using Rebecca to check meet the serpent. <sighs> There's a lot of actually mystery in the Bible. God is a wise God. And so therefore, in the last separation, because out of Jacob come the 12th tribe of Israel. And therefore, God has to actually return the favor. He said, okay, you, 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 one zero to me in Genesis 3. Let me wait. 2,000 years later, I will come back. Two days later. The Bible says, a thousand years like a day, one day like a thousand years. So two days later, the Lord said, let me return this favor. So out of this many so-called mechanician and maneuvering, God actually deceived. And also in that sense, checkmate the enemy that is trying to leverage on this twin. Because the oracle has given his word. And therefore, when at that point of time, Rebecca, based on what she took, heard from the Lord, and being a godly woman, she took the risk. In fact, she said, if there's a curse, let the curse be upon me. Following the subsequent verse where we less, less, where we less uh, left off. Yeah. He said, Let your curse be on me. He said, in case you are caught, let this curse. That means you see, this is a mother who takes risk. Why? Because she heard from the Lord. She believed what the Lord said. It was a risky decision to humanly speaking. And there are some level of risk. And then also, there's also a level of risk where it can actually get, if we get caught, it can be a curse instead of a blessing. And so Belka said, you know what? Let this curse be upon me. This is the quality of a godly mother who are always thinking of their children. Who are not only thinking horizontally they are thinking about children, vertically they are thinking about the will of God. That means they are both are actually always acting at the same time. There are some mothers who are only thinking for their children horizontally. Must give to the best, get to the best school, get to the best tuition, get the best teacher, get the best training. They are only thinking like that. And they actually omitted the vertical part. Because if you only think of providing your children the best only horizontally, you are imbalanced. You must also at the same time consider the will and the plan of God for your children. Rebecca is such a wonderful and godly woman that not only she hear from the Lord, she took the word of God seriously and is able to accommodate and actually plan according to the situation. 
Do you know this is a very serious matter for her to actually went against so-called the, the, the husband's will. Because the husband intend to bless Esau. So it seems that actually Rebecca is going against the husband's will. But actually it is not so. That is why there are times as mother, you need to make bold decisions. Sometimes when there's an offer from university that go for your children and say, you know what, we'll, we reject this university. Let's just send him to mission school. Sounds like a, sounds like a, hey, do you know this university, Harvard University, you know how much is every year the tuition fee, they are, they're sponsoring you for, for half a million over three years and you're saying no to this opportunity and you send your, ch your child to Tongling Bible School. Okay, sorry, not Tongling. <laughs> to, to, to any other school. Uh, <laughs> or any other Bible school. Uh, but Tongling is a good school. Also, okay? <laughs> so you just send it to a Bible school. To, to, to the world, this is crazy. I said, why do you want to do that? I mean, you're forfeiting the chance to, to go into an Ivy League college. You say no and you turn down an opportunity that costs you half a million over three to four years with the possibility of getting a doctorate. And then you send your kid to a Bible school. Because why? When in the pregnancy, you hear from the Lord that this child is mine. I will raise him up and I is gonna, he's going to serve me. See, when a, a mother who is sensitive had confirmation from the Lord, you don't fear, you act boldly. Even though this is against conventional wisdom, for Rebecca to seemingly go against her husband, this is a major step. You must understand, in that culture, it is the patriot that says, that controls everything. Right? But yet, Rebecca took that risk. And because why she heard from the Lord. You see, a godly mother is so important. If Rebecca did not do that and say that, well, you know, it's the Lord's will, you know, and according to the Jewish tradition, the older is the one that is the firstborn, he should get the double blessing, he should continue the priest. Esau is not interested in continuing the priest, so he just wants to have food. He just wants to satisfy himself. He, he can sell his birthright easily. The birthright, as we mentioned before, includes your right to be a priest. And he was not interested. So this is Mother's Day. I want to encourage mother that actually you play a pivotal role in your children's life. That your godliness, your spirituality can make a difference in your children's life. When you understand what God has the will for your child, when you hear from heaven, you are not caught by the system of the world where today there are many good Christians we are following the system of the world, lock, stock, and barrel. You know, we, we will not take that out of the system for fear that, hey, how can, you know, what, what if I take him out of school, then we lose out, then, you know, for example, like when God said, hey, you know, send young couples to go over to a third world country and do missions, straight away, the, the first thing that the, the parents, what about their education? If I take that out, oh, bring me to and then the next three years I'll be in this third world nation. Then what about the education? When they come back, they will have a hard time trying to follow. See, so, the, so the first consideration after praying, then you know what they say, after praying, we felt that we are led to stay here. <laughs> there are decisions that seem foolish to us. But if you were heard from the Lord, we need godly mothers, of course, fathers too. But today is Mother's Day. And in this instant, Rebecca is a role model to show us that this woman stood against the convention of the day and took a bold decision because she heard from the Lord and from the assurance from the oracle, the divine oracle, she stood firm and she executed it. And in the situation where she even has to use a little bit of maneuvering, she did it. That's why the Bible says, be as wise as a serpent. When you are dealing with serpent, you have to be one. But innocent as a dove. When you are dealing with your fellow human being, it's always innocent as a dove. Even if your friend is a serpent, you need to treat him still or her as innocent as this is the principle. This is not meant to say, oh, if your friend is a serpent, then I can be a serpent. And they say, no, 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 no. It's, it's not your it's the category is between spiritual entity and human entity. So if the entity you are dealing with is a spiritual entity, you need to be wise. Amen? If the entity you are dealing with is a human, you need to be innocent. That means even if they take advantage of us, even if we are being taken advantage, maintain the innocent position. 
The Bible says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad because great is the reward in heaven. Amen. So we are operating in a different principle. The kingdom principle is different from the principle of the world. And so you've got to give really, really a lot of credit to Rebecca. That under that circumstances, she actually made the bold move to make that decision. And when she made the decision, she immediately, you know, and, and when Jacob, of course, let's continue with Genesis 7. After they have blessed him, bless uh, Jacob. Of course, this part talk about how they put a different skin, the clothes over uh, Jacob so that the father can smell him, touch him, you know, and say that, you know, this is the son Jacob and continue. The next time we can skip this. Yeah. And, and Isaac said to his son, how is that you found it so quickly, my son? He said, because the Lord, your God brought it to me. Yeah. Because he's thinking, who are you? Are you my son Jacob or Esau? Yeah. And Jacob said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. Yeah, and then continue. He said, please come here that I may feel you, smell you, whether you're really my son. It was Esau, right? Jacob went near to his father. He felt him. The voice is Jacob's boy, but the hand, uh, hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his Esau's brother. So he blessed him. So in short, at this moment, Isaac blessed the son Jacob. Very important. Yeah, And that blessing are uh, all very powerful blessing. Going forward. Yep. And okay, this part we all know. Bring near. He said, eat. And then he brought the wine and he drank. So Jacob basically, sorry, Isaac basically had a good meal. Yeah. That Jacob brought to him. And next one, next few verses. And so, of course, then what we miss out, what he put on put out is the blessing that actually Isaac proclaimed on Jacob. And so that seal, that seal, so-called the blessing over Jacob's life. Covenantal blessing, only one blessing. But eventually Esau sought after another blessing. Yeah. And he said that he may kiss him and say, surely the smell is the smell of a field. Yeah. Then he said, therefore may God give you. No, no, we can go back to the same ones, uh, the, the one that you put just now. Yeah, May God give you the dew of heaven, fatness of the earth, plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you. Nation bow to you. Be master over your servant. You see, when Adam left, when Adam left Eden, they were made master by the enemy. In this covenant, in that sense, God reversed that. Now you will be master over your brethren. And let your mother's son bow to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. And blessed be those who bless you. Now this is a very pivotal moment. In the spiritual realm, God is actually reversing the spiritual positioning of His people. Because for the long time, God's people is under the oppression of people like Nimrod, who started the first world order. The one world system was started by Nimrod, by the way, in Genesis chapter 11. Yeah, And then continue. And, and of course, when, Jesus, when Esau came back, of course, he was uh, livid. He was livid. You know, he said, first he took away my birthright. He said, he said, first he took away my birthright. It was him that sold away his own birthright. Do you know that when there's a lot of unreasonable people in this world? Yeah. Many a times we make mistakes, we blame other people. This is amazing, including Christian. Spirit filled, tongue speaking, demon chasing. They behave like that. Shame on us. Please don't do that. Take responsibility for your own action. You make your mistake. You want the pot of lentil. You want the pot of rendang. And then you sold away the pot of rendang for your birthright. Now you say that he took away your birthright. No, you sold it away. Take some responsibility. The trouble with the trouble with people is that they have this disorder. That every time when bad things happen, we kick, we, we, we look for some people to blame. Oh. Adam, did you? Eat? Oh no, it's the woman that gave. A woman, did you? Oh no, it's the snake that gave. <laughs> we keep passing, you know, we go around, yeah. And now it's the same thing. Now he's, oh no, no, it's, it's he that took my birthright. When in reality, he was the one who despised his own birthright. But you see, these are the people of the world, the people who move in the natural. Guys, 
part of the process of discipleship is God can renew your mind from being a natural man to a spiritual man. You will agree, say amen. It's a shame that when people of God do, do, do business and do dealing and conduct our affair in the world like that, that means we make a mistake, but we don't own our mistake. We always find someone to blame. Oh, it's him who do this. It's him who do It's her, it's she. We got to stop this. This, this, is, this, is, this is unrighteous. In fact, this in fact, is taking the very personality of the serpent. Do you know that one of Satan's big plan is to make the people of God behave like him? That means if you claim that you're a Christian, Satan takes tremendous joy to condition your mind to behave just like him. This is the ultimate insult to your father. Ultimate insult to God. That means you claim to be a Christian and you call, we call ourselves a Christian, but we behave just like the devil. So when this is the characteristic of the devil, where you don't take action for your own responsibility, you, you blame other people. And this, we have to return. So the Bible says, repent for the kingdom of God. These are the things that we need to repent from. Not just from sin. Sin is a small matter. Sin, blood of Jesus can wash. But such kind of devious character, blood of Jesus cannot wash. This is only by the renewal of mind. That the word of God reconstruct us. Amen? That is why we, that's why the word of God is not just for us to memorize verses. No, it's not. It's to rewire our mind neurologically. Uh, to use a scientific term or a spiritual term to renew our mind. Because... One of the greatest joy that Satan has, think with me, take a step back. One of the greatest joy that Satan has is to see Christians living their hand praising God, but in our personal life, we conduct ourselves just like the serpent. This is the greatest, greatest pain that we are causing to the Father. The greatest humiliation that we give to our Father. That we call ourselves believer disciple of Christ, but we conduct in our daily life the characteristic of your stepfather as Ethan. And so, let's go back to... Yeah, thank you. So he said, it's not his name rightly called Jacob. He supplanted me twice, took away my birthright, and now he took away a blessing. Well, actually, he was first in that one account was right. His birthright, he sold it. But... The blessing, it was being actually through a divine move. So God, you see, it is not that God approved of Rebecca's lies in this instance. It is God approved of people that cheat. No, in this instance, there is a heavenly scheme that is going on. That means, in, you see, some, there are things that happen on earth and then there are things that happen on above. Just like, just like Job. What Job see in the nature is all his property, all his business, investment, all destroyed. But what takes place in the heavenly realm is God has a conversation with Satan. And he say, this is my man, that I have a righteous man, don't touch him. But Satan said, this guy worship you because you bless him. Take everything away from him. He will curse you. And God said, okay, I'll allow you to test him, but don't take his life. So you must understand that what happens on earth there is an apparent reality that happens in heaven. So when God wants to checkmate Satan, He has to use somebody who is willing to listen to, who trusts His judgment and wisdom and willing to cooperate with Him. Does that make sense? That means, that means, you see, that means in our life, not that God is approving us to be a thief or a, a conniver, no. In this instance, God is repaying the devil for what He has done to His people in Genesis 3. You deceive my first copper. Now I'm going to turn it around. And using the same way that you deceive my people, I'm going to apply it to you. And then I'm going to future it around and let the blessing now come. Take a look at verse 7. What does it say? It says, Isaac answered Esau. He said, Indeed, I have made him your master. Hallelujah. That means actually Esau represents the seed of the serpent, actually. He said, I make him your master. You see, that means if you are not spiritual, you will think God is a conniver. Right? You will think, well, oh, come, my God also cheat also. Come, uh, you know. No, no, no. This is a pivotal decision. It's the same when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Why does God disapprove of child sacrifice and then ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? Hey, God is 
a bit, you know, inconsistent. Firstly, you are against human sacrifice. And then you ask me to sacrifice my son. You see, so if you don't understand God, you think, oh, God is super cruel. Wow, you know, and then a lot of people get the wrong doctrine. Oh, wow, you know, God test me, you know, and test me, break me, you know. And, and actually, ultimately, you're just saying how spiritual you are. <laughs> no, God is not testing you. God is ratifying a covenant. You see, you, if you don't understand the spiritual realm, if you interpret everything according to the physical realm, it doesn't make sense. And then you come to the wrong conclusion about God. You come to the wrong conclusion about you. The only credit to you is because you are just obedient, but we are not that good. But sometimes when we make decisions like that, we like to brag in a very sober, oh, you know, I make so much sacrifice, God tested me. You know, we talk about how bad just to show how much we gave to God. How much we have sacrificed for God. Don't do that. We, that's why we need wisdom. Everything we do is by God's grace. How many believe that? Everything we do is by His grace. So we can't claim credit. If there's any, we can say, okay, I'm open for His grace to work in me. That's all we can claim. That we are obedient to the grace of God. That's all. You see, guys, I don't know whether you understand this. I hope today you catch something. There is something that God wants to do in the greater scheme of things. That means God has been planning this for 2,000 years. He said, I'm going to checkmate the enemy. I'm going to take back what he stole from me. The same way he deceived my people, I'm going to deceive him. So unless you understand the mind of God, that's why I said my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. For his ways are higher than his our ways. So unless we have the, have the ways and the minds of God, you were mistaken and think that he's ratifying deception. We will form wrong conclusion and think that, oh, thought, uh, that God approved deception. And then we say, oh, God also lied. <laughs> so, so if I lie, I'm just acting like God. <laughs> wrong conclusion. Amen. Are you getting this? I hope you get this. There, there are things that take place in the realm of the spirit that sometimes makes our earthly decision don't make sense. But you see, unless you possess the mind of God through this entity called wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, when you have that, when you have the mind of God, you will be able to flow with Him. You understand the scheme of things. Not that God wants to deceive Isaac. No, no. He actually is check making the spiritual entity. So that means there are times God will put you in so-called a disadvantaged position, but actually so that He can use you to checkmate the enemy. But if you're not willing to go through that, and then you come, then you interpret your misery from a human point of view, oh, then you have all the wrong conclusion. Then that means in, 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 the final, in the final step, that means God cannot use you because you are, you are only you are only mindful of the things on earth, the, the injustice you suffer, the, the things that is come to you, you know, the, all the so-called inconvenience that come to us. And we are so grasped by this that we actually miss the greater things that God wants to do. I want to emphasize this point because I am very impressed by Rebecca. Because this woman is not just a virtuous woman, but this woman is a godly woman who understands not only God's will for his son, he, she also understands God's will for the nation of Israel. Because if Rebecca did not make that move, Jacob will not be have the first blessing. That means he will not be the, the genesis of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a pivotal thing. It's, it's a very serious thing. Because out of Jacob's loin flows the 12 tribes of Israel. Now let me fast forward to you for Genesis 48. This, this tradition will continue. In Genesis 48, fast forward, Joseph got his whole family to Egypt, right? They stay in Goshen. And then now Joseph is getting old. Sorry, Jacob now is getting old. And then Joseph brought his son to, 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 uh, to Jacob. Jacob is getting old. And then he brought his son to Jacob. Genesis 48, let's start with verse 13. Yeah, Genesis 48, verse 13. So, so this is a scenario. Now it's time, Jacob's time to be old. Yeah? And, say, and, and Joseph brought his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. These two sons, bring over to him. And, and Joseph and Jacob say, these two sons is mine. That means God rejected Reuben. You see, firstborn rejected 
the, the first bond, the first bond of Joseph, uh, Jacob is Reuben. But he rejected Reuben. You know why? Because Reuben slept with his concubine. <laughs> so he was rejected. I see, every first is always rejected. That's why, on a side note, now, usually the elders in the family got a lot of challenges. I'm the eldest in my family also. Big challenges in my life. Yeah, but that aside, yeah, but great, big grace also. When there's big challenges, big grace also. Yeah, that's a good thing. And Joseph took them both. Listen to this. Ephraim is the younger one, Manasseh is the older one. Okay, so, so, so Joseph put Manasseh on his left side so that Manasseh can go to the right hand of Joseph. Put Ephraim on the right side so that Ephraim can go on the left hand of Joseph. And what did Joseph do? Next verse. And, and what did Jacob do? Sorry, I keep getting confused with it, these two names. Yeah, next two verse. <laughs> well, let's go to... And Israel stretched out his right hand on Ephraim. Uh, yep. Yeah. And Israel stretched out his right hand and lay on Ephraim, who was a younger and left hand on Manasseh. That means actually, end up, he crossed hand. Wow. Even though Joseph came to ask him to bless the elder as the firstborn, Jacob, even though he's dim in the eyes, but spiritually now he's alert, he knows that the principle is to bless the younger. Wow. So Israel stretched out his right hand and lay on Ephraim's with the younger and left hand on Manasseh, guiding his hand knowingly for Manasseh was the firstborn. And then Joseph intervened, the next two verses. Joseph thought that, you know, Jacob, his father, is making a mistake, right? Let's continue the next three verses or two verses. Have another. And he blessed Joseph. Is this 15 and 16 ready? Huh? Okay. And blessed Joseph. Okay, so the father blessed Joseph first. What about that part they say, I know my son? Uh, what verse is that? Is it 17 to 19? Yeah, thank you. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the hill of Ephraim, it displeased him. And so he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head. To Manasseh. So he thought that his father is making a mistake. And what the verse 18 says. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one firstborn, put your right hand on this head. And the father refused, I know, my son, I know. Watch it out. Say it He said, He shall become a people and he shall be great. But truly, this younger brother shall be greater than him, as descendants shall become. A multitude of nations. You see, because Rebecca made the right decision, the right step. And today they continue and then he can finally continue this inducting. So even in this blessing, you find that they always bypass the firstborn. As a side note, do you know that Israel had this tradition called the redemption of the firstborn? Every firstborn is to be redeemed with five shekels of silver. Scholars say that it is because in the while they were in Egypt, when the angel of death passed by that night, every firstborn was struck dead in Egypt except those who were in Israel. So therefore, the redemption of firstborn started there, but I beg to differ. I believe the redemption of firstborn started in Genesis 3 because every firstborn since the day Cain was incepted, every firstborn inherited a certain DNA that caused them to be rejected by God. 1 John 3, 12. Cain was the first son of, Cain was the first son of Adam and Eve. But yet under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John the Apostles say that not like Cain, who is of the wicked one. Wow, Cain is of the wicked one. I thought he's the first son of Adam and Eve. How, how can he be considered the wicked one? That means, guys, we do not know how it happened. Yeah, there are different theories that's been so called uh, 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 different opinion and theory formed by different scholars. Yeah. Something that there's something happened between uh, physically that takes place that caused Cain to be the firstborn. 
Yeah, but I believe that when they partook of that that fruits, I believe the DNA of the enemy got into Adam. I believe so. I stand corrected. This is not scriptural. This is only my interpretation. Please don't take it as Bible truth. But this is part of the fun of studying the Bible. Amen? This is part of fun of exploring the Bible because we can be corroborated where John the Apostle said Cain is of the wicked one. Now the question is, I thought Cain is the firstborn of Adam. How come, how come John said that he is born of the wicked one? That means when Cain was conceived, it is very, I don't think I'm that far from the truth that when Cain was conceived, the DNA of the enemy through the fruits of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was actually transferred into Adam and that he was incepted. That means, that means Satan, his, actually his ploy was to make sure since God is going to populate the earth, he makes sure that his nature is transferred to the firstborn. That's why there's a redemption of the firstborn. Like I say, this is not gospel truth. Yeah, this is my own study, my inclination, my view that I hold based on what I understand in my own little study. If I'm right, no problem. If I'm wrong, it doesn't affect our salvation. Amen? But it's just saying that there are, there are layers of truth that we need to explore. So it's not just like people, children always say, oh, you know, I don't eat the apple. God never asked to eat the apple. And then God very angry, eat the apple. You know, and then God punished, boom, you know. <laughs> but don't, don't laugh. Christian, after 30 years, they still believe in this, just like this. Such simple, simple act. And God so upset, God so petty, you know, angry with, you know, all these Christian, huh, disobedient, eh, and hantam you, you know. No. There, there are things that goes on, you know, that we don't understand. Amen. That's why you see, Genesis 6. What is the purpose of Genesis? Genesis 6 is the purpose, again, is to contaminate, to contaminate the, the line of the seed of the woman. When, when, the, when the fallen angel mated with human being and produced this hybrid called Nephilim, the whole idea is to contaminate the whole human race. That's what they've been trying to do. I said this in our Bible study, uh, respect, I mean, in a few occasions, but let me close with this. John 8, 44. John 8, 44 is a scripture that to me is it, it, a very, very serious announcement when Jesus tell the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribe and he said that you are of your father the devil, the desire of father that you want to do. Can you imagine Jesus allocate and actually labor the religious order of the day and say that you are of the father the devil. Now, this is a serious statement that Jesus made. Yeah, I, I, I said respectfully in Thursday, I said this is actually equivalent to someone going to the, to the Pope and say this to him. Very serious that you are of the father, the devil. The, the, the religious leader of the day, they, they occupy the highest office religious in religion. And Jesus said, you are of the devil. Something for us to consider. That means... The lie in Genesis 3, when God gave the curse to the serpent about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, there's two lineage. Until today, I believe these two lineage exist on earth. Anyway, before we get into the rabbit trail, what we want to really um, remind us is that mothers are very, very strategic. Mothers, godly mothers are very powerful. That when you walk closely with God, when you become a godly woman, your decision, every step you do, every decision you make can impact the spiritual destiny of your children. Amen? That when you're in line with God, that what decision you make, what you do, actually can actually affect how your children will prosper. And not only how your children will prosper, but how God's plan, His will can be done on earth. Amen? That means when you want God's will to be done, it comes in different way. That even as a mother, not just an individual, even as a mother, more so, and fathers too, that when we are godly, when we are connected to God, when we are able to discern God's will for us, for the clan, for the nation, for His kingdom, we are very in line with Him and we become a vessel that God can use confidently knowing that you will not miss them that you can execute the decision and the plan. Not going to your mind and then you 
and then you you know go through your own system of reasoning and I say, well, cannot be. Well, can God ask me to do this? But rather you are because you've been in line. The first thing when Rebecca went to see the oracle during pregnancy, immediately she knew the seriousness of this matter. They said two nations are inside. That means not just twins is inside. Two nations. That means these are twins, but they represent a different people group. One is a line that represents the, the line of righteousness. Unfortunately, the other line represents the line that's rejected. And therefore, God's will has to continue in the right line. And so Rebecca's decision is actually momentous. Her ability to stick on to the voice of God and execute his decision, despite going against the tradition of the day, that actually took the cake. That actually was the icing on the cake. That she became the vessel that God can use to let his will be done on earth. Mothers, you are very important today. That when you are godly, when you are filled with the Spirit, when you are filled with God's wisdom, you can play a tremendous role and influence over your posterity, your descendants, your children and your children's children. See, even Jacob at an old age was still not dull. He Even when his son brought him the two kids, his grandchildren, he placed his hand at the right way. Amazing. This tells us God's that means these people of that generation, they understand the, the implication, the spiritual implication of the firstborn and the secondborn. And God determined the younger will be served by the older. And with that prophecy and word that's given as a promise, the people must continue to cooperate with God. You know what I mean? That means if God say the younger will be served by the older, you must believe. And you must act accordingly. Otherwise, the tradition will say, no, the firstborn is the one that takes over. And then if you go according, by the way, this is a commandment that is set by God. And yet God has to bypass because of the intervention in Genesis, Genesis 3. So that means, it's four o'clock already. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes God may seem to ask us to do things that may not seem right. But we must understand His heart and know what is the greater purpose. There are things that take place on earth, but conceal is the things decision that takes place in heaven. That if you have no understanding of that, you will argue until you come home, and then you will say, why is it wrong? And then you waste all your time, and then going through a lot of big moral, and then all the human reasoning eventually will get us nowhere. So today is Mother's Day. I want to honor all mothers, that mothers... Thank you for doing a tremendous job. And I pray that God will raise you up. Continue to be stronger mothers so that you not only are providing for your child physically, but you become, you know, providing spiritual direction and guidance for your children. And then you become the mentor. You become the instrument to execute the very will of God over your child's life. Amen. Let's stand. Hi guys, I uh, hope that you are, thank you for listening to the messages that you have been checking in. And I pray that all those messages that you listen, that you will take time to like and subscribe. And if you have any comment, I would love to hear from you. If you learn anything from the message, I hope that you can share your comment. And I believe that this is a message that's preparing, all the messages that we preach are preparing the church for the return of the King. And I believe this is a timely message going forward. And so I pray that you continue to Tune in and also to take time to share and subscribe. God bless you.